Off the box, yeah. we're gonna have someone else, not me. You hold it. <laughs> no, 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 we're gonna have this lovely lady here. Just full of questions. Just full one. Uh, I do want to say my own quick question to the both of you. My own quick question to the both of you is <clears throat> many moons ago, uh, when a lot of us were NAACP people, uh, we cut an agreement with the school committee at the time to create a civil service day in the high schools where we would take a full day and do trainings on how to take the civil service test to inform high school students that were 18 going on age to take the test, to study for the test, to talk to people about how to acquire these jobs. So my first question before we even go in the box are whoever happens to be mayor next time around, I try to stay in the truth, whoever happens to be there next time around, are you willing to create in the local high schools a venue or format to teach high school seniors on how to take the civil service test? And that way we can hire youth in our own community. All right, I think it's a great idea. Um, as chair of the school committee, I'm part of the seven, group of seven that are charged with creating policy for the schools. And one area where I often butt heads with some of my counterparts and my colleagues is on the notion that every child is uh, should be groomed to go to college. Um, I speak of that from experience. My parents had two children, me and. Uh, I have a younger brother who's two years younger than I am. He was a smart kid, um, but was not college material. He liked to play with the cars that I would buy. I, I would bring a car home and I'd go off to college and when I'd come home on break, uh, I'd have a, a manual transmission instead of an automatic one because he wanted to play around with my car. Um, so in answer to Tim's question, absolutely it is a good idea. I, I think our, our job as adults, as parents, as leaders of the community, is to put our children in a position where they can get a good paying job, a living wage job. For some children, that means higher education in the form of a college degree or a certificate program. For others, it might be vocational technical training. And for still others, it might be being coached to take a civil service exam. So I'm 100% in favor of that proposal. And I just wanted to clarify um, one thing because I'm not sure if Mr. Potter had heard me say it, but I did call for one of those Part 10 lists when I got into office. And I, I just wanted to make sure that the audience was aware of that, but that was the first list that I called for on the police hiring. <laughs> I, I thought it was a pretty direct uh, question. I'm going to answer it directly. The answer the question is yes. You know, it's simple. You know, you want to have a civil service day in the high schools to teach uh, eight, 17, and 18 year olds how to take the test. I think it's a great idea. Uh, the answer is yes. That's simple. I think uh, Tim Potter should run for school committee. I think it's some good ideas. And no. <laughs> My youngest is 28. <laughs> but I do have grandchildren in the school. Uh, okay, uh, Mr. Harrison, do we have the first question? Uh, Mr. Ferguson? And the first question from the audience. Yeah, I gotta put my peepers on. This is over 55 cheaters. Okay, here's the question, Mayor and uh, a candidate. I know civil service applicants who score over 90% and was never offered a firefighter position. This was a minority applicant. What would you change? This is from the audience. Do you want to stand it up you, you all got to stand up once. I think I'm better off with the blood flowing. Um, you know, 90%, unfortunately these days, is often not enough of a score to get somebody hired. Um, one of the reasons is that 
in communities throughout the Commonwealth, it's very difficult to increase the number of police and firefighters on a job. Now, I have brought those numbers up. From the 160s in 2009, they're up to about 190 apiece today. But I honestly can't see myself expanding much more beyond 190 without it being too much of a burden to the taxpayer. So the people who are often getting those jobs, as I had mentioned before, the disabled veterans go to the very top of the list. The um, veterans without a disability go to the second spot on the list. And then we start looking at the ranked um, scores. And I don't think I've ever gone below a 93 or a 92 when I've been choosing these batches of candidates for the fire and police positions. In fact, um, some of the time I don't get out of the veterans list. And uh, it's, I guess, a sign of the times that we have people who are scoring so well and, un and an unfortunate sign of the times that we have so many veterans coming back because we've had so many wars that we've fought over the last 10 or so years. Um, so the 90 percentile, I think that was probably simply because that score was not high enough and maybe some trainings, as Mr. Potter had suggested, on teaching children or young adults how to take that civil service test would improve the scores and therefore give them a greater opportunity to get one of those jobs. Uh, thank you. First thing I'd like to point out is the increase in firefighters, 160 to 190, um, isn't done by anybody that says I. Uh, federal grants were obtained by a Democratic congressman. Uh, those grants came to the city council. We approved those available funds, uh, and then they're sent on to the mayor's office. It's a collective effort. But really, the issue here is not who scored the 93, who scored the 95, who's a veteran, who isn't a veteran, is why is that person scoring a 90? What can we do as a municipality to reach out to those people who are adults now, who are out of the school system, who are taking these tests? What can we do? Can we work with Operation Bootstrap to expand their programs? Um, do we have to identify what that issue is as a city collectively and put a program in place that we can assist people in improving their scores so that they're on an equal playing field? And that's how you address the problem systemically. Thank you. Can you find Brown. a lucky Mr. person? Can you pick the next question, sir, please? Yes, indeed. All right. Excuse me, sir. A stalwart in the community, Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, thank you, sir. Mr. Brown, he always wears the best ties. My goodness. I hope everyone's being informed this evening. I mean, I look out over the crowd and everyone has a serious face on them. I'm hoping that you're... <laughs> Stop. I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, you're absorbing as well as enjoying the opportunity to hear both of them speak close up and personal. Yes, sir. Oh, here's a good one. <laughs> yes, indeed. Okay, and here is the question from the audience. <clears throat> Lynn was near the top in communities with high foreclosure rates. People struggling to stay in their homes needed a tool to help them, and the foreclosure ordinance recently passed by the Lynn City Council gives them that tool so they can work out a payment plan with their lenders. High foreclosures. Are you, for those of us, and, and are, are you for it or not, and why? Well, I think everybody here is probably aware that I vetoed that when it came across my desk, and then the city council overrode the veto. And my veto had nothing to do with wanting to keep people in their homes or wanting to see them gone from their homes or not wanting lenders to get involved. What it had to do with was purely a matter of litigation that would follow, I imagined, if the city council were to adopt it. And the reason being is that up in the state legislature, there is already a panel put together consisting of 13 individuals who are all coming from the field of expertise, whether it's housing, mortgage origination, um, housing advocacy people, 
bankers, uh, they are working on creating a uniform system within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that will provide a step-by-step -step procedure in which um, people in danger of losing their homes will be able to be counseled and will be able to speak to their banks. They are developing that, pro that program right now. I felt as though if the city of Lynn were to adopt an ordinance, in, in my estimation, prematurely, that we would put people at a disadvantage if they were coming to Lynn and wanted to um, borrow money to buy a home. And I didn't want to see that happen. I also felt as though if every community in the, in the Commonwealth did this, there would be 351 sets of rules and regulations for the bankers to follow. And again, I thought it would ultimately be harmful to the city of Lynn. I think most people know that Pete Capano and I spearhead this uh, homeowner bill of rights. Um, I've always had the philosophy, you, uh, you don't not do something for fear of failure. And, you know, if we wait for the federal government and the state government to have a committee and let them come up with something, we're going to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait, and that's what we're still doing right now. The Homeowner Bill of Rights, the city of Lynn was hit with literally hundreds of foreclosures. People lost their homes. They lost their homes because they lost their jobs. Someone in, the, in their home got sick. They got cancer. They couldn't keep up with the payments. And they had a difficult time actually reaching the big banks. The big banks in Idaho, Wyoming, wherever they're located, going through the 800 number. They'd finally get somebody, and then by the time they talked to them and they get a letter in the mail, they would say something different. And they, people would lose their homes because of it. And then they would, they would lose their home when they, they were just trying to um, get some type of uh, a delay uh, in pay and give us three months off. So what we did, we worked with the Register of Deeds who said that he won't record a foreclosure deed until the bank actually sits down and has mediation with the homeowner. It doesn't force the bank to do anything. What it does, it doesn't force them to modify a loan. It only forces them to talk to somebody face to face. Talk to them, make it personal to them. And, you know, Eastern Bank said one foreclosure in five years because it's personal, it's close to home. And my philosophy and the city council's philosophy was, if this can save one person's home from going into foreclosure and losing it, it's worth it. Thank you both. And we have time for a few more, I think. Yes, indeed. Good answers, good answers. You guys are in practice, aren't you? <laughs> After this, we're doing arm wrestling. Okay? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I want to make an application. Okay. Thank you, guys. I'm sorry, folks. I, you know, you get this age after a certain time, you get kind of batty. Okay, and here we are with the next question. Thank you, Mr. Murkison. What is your stance on the soup kitchen? Would you keep it? Um, would you keep it at its present location? So I guess this is a two-fold question. Would you keep the soup kitchen, number one? Two, would you keep it at its same location? Yes or no, and why? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I haven't heard it called the soup kitchen in a long time, uh, but my brother's table uh, and the shelter. Um, it's a needed service in the city of Lynn. Uh, it, it really is. It helps a lot of people. Uh, you know, people that um, are down and out. Um, I volunteer down there. My children have volunteered down there. But I don't think it's in the right location. Uh, we're trying to develop the downtown. And uh, people will come into the city of Lynn and they see the shelter in my brother's table. And, and, and they're afraid. The perception of it is not good. So I think we need to find a better location. I'm not saying eliminate it. I'm not saying close the doors because I do think it's a needed service, but I think that it's, it's not the right location. If you go to downtown Salem, which is beautiful, they don't have their homeless shelter there. If you go to Quincy Market or Faneuil Hall, the Pine Street Inn isn't there. It's at a better location. I do legal work for the Pine Street Inn. It's at a wonderful location on transportation, but it's not the right mix. And it's politically insensitive you know, you, people are afraid to talk about it, but it is a real issue if we really want to develop the downtown. I love my brother's table and the work they do. I, I served on the board of directors there for six years, 
and I've been volunteering in one capacity or another for about 15 years. So in my mind, absolutely, the soup kitchen, as it's called, has to stay. Um, the other part of the question, should it stay in its present location, the, the simple legal answer is it almost has to stay in its own, own location, um, the current location. And let me explain why. The building that it's in, many of you know, it's a National Historic Landmark, it's called the Old Post Office. And we got that property given to us by a deed from HUD when they were getting rid of old government properties that were excess. It was given to us um, in the form of a deed in December of 1990. And part of the deed restriction is that for 30 years, that building has to be used for homeless services. So even if the whole, the, my brother's table were to move out of that building when the lease is up in 2015, I think it is, the building itself cannot be used for anything other than homeless services until after December of 2020. So while it may be in a bad spot as far as people looking to develop, um, right now our alternative would be to return that piece of property to the federal government because we'd be violating the rules of the deed, or we would have to vacate all of the, um, the, the services that are in there and possibly not be able to provide them anymore. And I would not want to see that happen, so in my opinion, it should stay where it is. lady here pull question for us and she's got her Red Sox jersey on. Actually the score was when I came upstairs one to zip in the bottom of the second Red Sox. Well see you know you know, on television now, they have this new thing they talked about on the Today Show, which I'm in favor of, which is another question I'm going to hit you all about texting while you're driving in the city limits. They call it phone stacking. So when you come into a meeting or a dinner, everybody stacks their phone in the middle of the table. Okay, and here we go. Eyes are going over here. And here's the next question. Oh, I feel like Bob Barker. Uh, <clears throat> are there any programs to enhance African American or minority businesses in the city of Lynn? Specifically, African American. Um, I think it's your turn, Ms. The programs that I'm aware of are open to all communities. Um, I know that we have, uh, I can't think of the name of it right now, this uh, Brown Girl to Brown Girl that had been in operation for a while. That's not really for businesses per se, but it is specifically directed to young women of color in order to get them um, role models, uh, some mentoring to enhance their sense of self-esteem. We do have other um, business-related we have the Small Business Assistance Center over on Willow Street, <coughs> run through community development, and we have the Service Corps of Retired Executives, which will also um, assist anybody who's in need of, of help with a small business. And I think it's really important that we continue these. As I had mentioned earlier, we have the EDIC, which provides not only location services, um, but, in, um, but also gives out those loans in order to assist small businesses. Um, we do what we can do. And I think for the most part, it is done in the community of Lynn in a colorblind manner. I don't know of anything uh, off the top of my head that is specifically geared toward African American small businesses. You know what, I, I want to just touch base. I know it was at the very end of what I was saying originally, uh, the Invest Lynn project that I was talking about. Um, at the very end, this is with the uh, uh, putting out the city's money to bid to the depositories. Uh, one of the things that is, uh, is very uh, prevalent going across the country now 
uh, with the federal government and different programs that are out there are incentives for female-owned businesses and minority-owned businesses. And uh, with the program that I'm putting forward, if I'm fortunate enough to win this election, would be the investment project would mandate those banks who take our money to give even a lower interest rate to minority-owned and female-owned businesses as an incentive to come to the city of Lynn. And again, that's something real. Thank you. Last question. I do want to say that uh, I think that in the state of Massachusetts, you guys, it's called Samba Certification. Yes. Samba Certification is a set aside program that is based in the state of Massachusetts in the Commonwealth to identify businesses of color and uh, give them first crack at possible uh, projects and, and initiatives. Well. And women as well. That's why it's called Samba Certification. Thank you, Chair. I'm old. <laughs> Years of practice, that's why. Okay, we're going to pick another question. The uh, question that was picked was repetitive, we've already asked. So we're going to have this gentleman here. Thank you, sir, for your support. And your Red Sox. He's got his Red Sox here. Four to zip, Red Sox. We do have uh, another gentleman that's got a couple of minutes. He's a dude. He's a Miguel is running for council, so we want to grab him and get him up here in a second. This is the last question. One more. Let's try it again. Try one more time. It, it is actually similar to what we just discussed. You know, in retrospect, it was about African American businesses. Bids on contracted. And that, once again, is some certification. Thank you. Yes, sir. I didn't write it down, but I have a question. Yes, sir. It's got to do with safety. Yes, sir. You drive around these other cities, you see those crosswalks, you go to Salem, they're red, Saugus, they're another color, and green. What are they, blue? Blue. Right. Look at our crosswalks. Yes, sir. You can't even get the lines painted properly. Okay, uh, I'll give each candidate uh, 30 seconds to do that. No, we'll take that. You, you want to do the last one? Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Johnson, we're going to do uh, a safety question on, uh, and of course we have, you know, a increasingly growing number of seniors, including Lizzo, <laughs> that live in the city, and safety is a major issue. So, uh, a very good point, and Tim, it's your turn. Thank you. You know, uh, that issue and a lot of DPW issues have been very frustrating for a lot of members of the city council. Uh, what we have to do is we have to uh, put a request into the DPW. Uh, I think, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think a lot of city councils have publicly stated that they feel the DPW is underfunded. Uh, there are, I think, 47 employees, but actually only 23 people on a size of 90,000 actually work out on the street, and that's including the people that work at the cemetery. It's not enough to get the job done. Uh, we need to put more resources into that for issues just like this, for fixing sidewalks, for fixing potholes, and uh, it's frustrating to me, and it's frustrating to my colleagues. I agree with you. First of all, um, where's Tim? Hi. We did hire through that Samba sort of uh, through the Samba program the uh, contractor who did uh, the air conditioning for the city hall auditorium was brought in through that. Um, through that bid process, it was a $1.1 million job, and it was a minority-owned business that did that job. Um, with respect to the crosswalks, that money doesn't come out of the city's um, budget per se. It comes out of our Chapter 70 money, and we have been using that Chapter 70 money to for three things. It's to replace um, streets, paved streets, 
to fix sidewalks and to do the, it's called thermoplastic markings, which you would consider the crosswalk paintings. Um, when we do the crosswalk paintings, we have chosen to do the white lines only for a very specific reason. And this goes back to the prior DPW commissioner. The, if you paint the entire crosswalk, if you have blue in the middle and white on either side, first of all, it's simply more expensive because you're paying for additional paint coverage. But more importantly, he felt that it was a safety issue because those thermoplastic um, amalgams that they use to put on the street become slippery in wet weather. And he felt that it was better to keep the plain asphalt in the middle with the white lines. Okay, um, everyone please put your hands together for the audience. this back over to Mr. Murchison. Uh, thank you all. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Potter. We appreciate that. And again, thank you to the candidates here. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Mr. Damon Harrison. At this time, I'm going to have the uh, candidates ask two questions of one another. Um, I guess that'll be something that they would really want to put out to the forefront why they think they should be mayor of the city of Atlanta, and they want to just point out the differences between themselves and their opponents. Or <laughs> Good evening. I grew up in a large family uh, in a small house and you had to speak loud to get yourself heard, so I went off to use the microphone. I hope you found tonight's event interesting, thought-provoking, and perhaps even a little bit fun. We're coming to the final portion of this candidate's night debate. We're called the Lincoln-Douglas debate. In 1858, candidates Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas held a series of presidential debates that were innovative for their time. Rather than have a moderator ask them questions, Lincoln and Douglas challenged one another and they asked each other questions that were very passionate to them. In that venue, the mayoral candidates, Kennedy and Phelan, about to ask each other questions that they feel passionate about. And let the dance begin. And we were supposed to flip a coin, but chivalry is not dead. Ladies first. <laughs> I still had my coin flip app on my phone, but I took it off. Um, Councilor Phil, in July of 2011, I was presented with a trash ordinance from the Lynn City Council, and I vetoed it at the beginning of July in 2011. Um, I saw from the newspaper in September of 2011 that the council was working on it. When I did not receive a revised trash ordinance for over a year, I presented a draft proposal in August of 2012 to the Lynn City Council. I still have not received any trash ordinance from the City Council. Why is that? Uh, thank you. Well. Uh, the Lynn City Council is, uh, first you have the executive branch, which is you, uh, then you have the, the legislative branch, which is 11 different people. Uh, the trash ordinance goes to the ordinance committee, which has a chairman, uh, which is not me, and I don't sit on the city on the ordinance committee. However, what I have been told is that when they first presented the ordinance, that uh, the, the Chamber of Commerce and the DPW commissioner at the time were all in favor of this, as you were you and they were surprised to get it back that it was vetoed. Uh, they then, it's my understanding, and again, I don't want to speak for anybody else, that they attempted to communicate with the mayor's office and other people, and that communication was um, not as good as it could have been. And uh, it's my understanding now that uh, there's negotiations going on with waste management that uh, really can't conclude until a trash ordinance is in place and no one on the city council ordinance committee has been informed as to what's going on with, except what's reading in the newspaper. So really what appears to be happening is that 
There's just poor communication between the executive branch and the legislative branch, and it's resulting in a stalemate or a stalling of something that's very important to the city. You know, I, I, you are obviously aware, um, as are most people in the city of Lynn, uh, that there was a, a major issue with a, a city council computer. And, uh, and when the council first became aware of it, uh, there was a city council meeting, and uh, we got a, a letter from Mr. Weeks. We called him, invited him to the meeting. He sent a letter stating that uh, he was going to come. No need to subpoena me. I'm going to come to the, uh, the city council meeting to answer questions from the city council. Uh, the council, um, anyway, voted and subpoenaed Mr. Weeks. Uh, Mr. Weeks uh, didn't show up to the city council meeting, stating that he only got four days notice instead of the five days mandatory notice. Uh, so um, nothing we could do about that, even though he already told us that he was going to come. Uh, the city council then, uh, within the past seven days, have first served him again. The law department was informed today that uh, Mr. Week, by Mr. Week's attorney, that he was going to go to court and squash the subpoena and uh, not appear at the city council meeting this up upcoming Tuesday night. So my question to you is, uh, do you support Mr. Ken Weeks coming to a public forum in front of the people of the city of Lynn, in front of the Lynn item, in front of Lynn Camp TV, honoring that subpoena and answering questions about what occurred and his position in an open and fair process and manner and would you order him to do so as the mayor? I would never interfere with a person's right to be represented by an attorney or for that person to follow the advice of that attorney. I haven't, talking, I haven't spoken with Mr. Weeks or his attorney about this. He's represented by counsel and I'm not going to interfere with anybody who's represented by counsel. I know that there are... I don't think he has any problem with speaking to the Lynn City Council. Um, but I would say he is well within his rights to try to get something to quash the subpoena. And just by the way, for everybody to know, I have, as the mayor, 10 days to sign City Council orders when they are put on my desk. I signed every single council order from that batch, from that City Council meeting, on the same day. And I want you to know, I did not veto the subpoena that was going to Mr. Weeks. I signed it. I think that the council can exercise their rights to issue the subpoena, and Mr. Weeks can issue his right, can can follow his rights to retain an attorney and seek to, to quash it if that's what his attorney wants to do. Thank you very much. So we're going to close out tonight's event by allowing the candidates to speak for two minutes, closing statements. I had asked this before, um, what three improvements would you make in the area of public safety and how would you implement and or fund them? Thanks. I have a different philosophy on public safety. Uh, because public safety is more than just the number of police officers on the street. I'm a big advocate of having a lot of police officers on the street. I've always supported SROs and CLTs. But I really do think that to really address crime and public safety systemically over a long period of time, you have to do it two ways. You have to do it with early childhood education, and you have to do it with jobs on the other end. And if you really want to address something long term, that's how you have to do it. One of the programs that I am advocating for, which I say is the foundation of everything, education is the foundation of everything, including public safety, is early childhood education. You know, right now, three and four year olds in, in, in pre K in the city of Lynn are selected by lottery. Hundreds and hundreds of kids don't make it into the pre K program because the, the uh, argument is there's not enough space. 
Um, I say we do have space. You know, first, all the, all the studies say kids that, those three and four year olds that get that education, that early childhood education, they increase post -grad, high school graduate uh, education, their uh, the home ownership goes up, um, uh, teen pregnancy goes down, their higher wage earners. At a younger age, there's um, less um, uh, special education needs, social behaviors improve. Every single st study says that. So, what I'm proposing is every principal and, and custodians, they work in the summertime. The schools are open in the summertime. I say the kids that don't win the lottery, those three and four year olds, um, that we open those schools for the first time year round for pre-K for the kids that don't win it so they can get that early childhood education. Thank you. is facing the city of Lynn right now, um, everybody's reading about it, talking about it everywhere I go, is, uh, is Union Hospital. Uh, the, 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 the changing dynamic and the, the potential loss of, of uh, the largest, uh, we will be the largest city in Massachusetts without full care um, hospital services. Uh, Union Hospital right now is going to psychiatric, uh, substance abuse and behavioral, and, uh, and it's gonna change uh, the medical services in the city of Lynn forever. Uh, you know, something that I brought up a couple of weeks ago, and everybody is up in arms about it. Um, right now, uh, I am in the process of forming uh, a committee that's going to be uh, a, technically a city council committee, but it's going to be made up of 11 to 13 people in the community. It's going to be a union hospital oversight committee. Uh, it is going to be made up of doctors, nurses, Ward 1 residents, um, elected officials, uh, people in the health industry. And, uh, and we need to get at the table to begin negotiating, force our way in the door at the state level with the, um, the CEOs and the board of directors at Partners and North Shore Medical Center. So my question to you is, if you are offered a seat on this committee, would you accept it? Really glad you brought up Union Hospital. No, I would not accept it, because I have already been in contact with Bob Norton, who is the CEO of North Shore Medical Center. I've met with him half a dozen times over the last couple of weeks. I have had um, a meeting with Gary Gottlieb, Dr. Gary Gottlieb, who is the CEO of Partners Healthcare. I have met with Rich Holbrook, who is the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the North Shore Medical Center. I have a meeting scheduled with the Board of Trustees, the remainder of them, with the North Shore Medical Center. And all of this came about, I will have you know, uh, uh, stemming from a debate that was at the Knights of Columbus a couple of Mondays ago. On, at that debate, each of us, each of the candidates, was allowed to ask the other candidate a question. Now, I did not know this at the time, but Bob Norton, the chairman of uh, North, the CEO of North Shore Medical Center, had made an appointment to come in and see me that Wednesday. So on Monday night, I showed up at the debate, and we had uh, one question to ask of one another. And Councillor Phelan said to me, what is the most important issue facing Ward 1? Now, I knew nothing about the Union Hospital plans at that time. In fact, Councillor Phelan's knowledge came from a doctor within the hospital and not from any official source, such as the CEO of North Shore Medical Center or of um, uh, Partners Healthcare. So what he did was pretty much took a rumor and presented it to me as a question without disclosing that he had knowledge that I did not have. I found that to be uh, terrible, to make Union Hospital into a piece of political fodder, and um, I hope nobody believes the hype that's out there on the, uh, on the flyers that are saying I was asleep at the switch. I just don't act on rumors. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I actually met with a uh, not 
a single doctor, and it wasn't based on rumors, uh, if you watch the debate. Um, I did my research, and I'm the one that pointed out the systematic reduction in services over a long period of time to make Union Hospital not profitable. What I think is important about being the mayor of the city of Lynn, it's more than managing numbers. It's building relationships. What's frustrating to me is when I read in the Salem Evening News last week that the mayor of Salem has negotiated a $172 million emergency room for Salem Hospital and she has already spoken with the State Department of Transportation for infrastructure improvements along the highway going into Salem 107, which is a state highway. To me, that's unacceptable. You know, the CEO, and I, this is, I don't mean any disrespect, but the CEO of any large city needs to be on top of those things. So my question to you, Councillor Phelan, would be, if you had this knowledge, why did you not tell me? Why did you wait to spring it in a debate when you knew I didn't have that knowledge? I didn't know you didn't have that knowledge until the question was asked, and you said the most important thing facing the city of Lynn and Ward 1 was traffic in Wyoma Square. The, uh, the, I compare this to one of the things that I've been bringing up um, recently at, at a number of the debates is the lack of communication with the people at Suffolk Downs, with what hasn't happened so far, that we don't have a negotiating panel in place, that we haven't begin, begun that dialogue. I've said that in a number of debates, if you go back and look at the debates, and tonight's the first night that we've ever heard of any letter being sent anywhere. You know, and maybe it's a good wake up, because we can't get caught, you know, with, you know, we need to be ahead of the curve instead of behind the curve, because we can't have two businesses coming into the city and five businesses leading, leaving the city. You know, we need to be the leaders. You know, we need to, you know, people get frustrated when I say downtown Salem is happening. It's happening, it's gorgeous. Why can't Lynn be down like downtown Salem? I say that to our development people, they get mad at me. And we have to learn, what are they doing right? Why are they ahead of the curve and we're not? And that, I just have, it's the same thing when we talk about, you know, the homeowner bill of rights. You know, let's not do it for fear of something's gonna go wrong. I just have a different philosophy when it comes to that. Thank you. That question was asked by him. That, that was his question to me. Um, so if you want to know what being set up feels like, that's exactly what, what it feels like. Um, I just want to get back and end this on a positive note and ask all of you to think back about the state of the city in 2009 and the state of the city today. We've gone up from 163 and 165 police officers and firefighters up to 190 today. I have negotiated a health care um, contract with every union in the city of Lynn that kept them out of the GIC, kept them in the health care plan that we've all uh, come to be accustomed to, and saved the city over $4 million in the first year of that. I have been very inclusive in my selections of people on boards and committees. I have tried to make this city a place that is fair for everybody. I have tried to make this a place where we do have pride 
in our downtown. I have brought in businesses. I've brought in Market Basket. I brought Kettle Cuisine over to the Linway. We have a Rosetti's restaurant opening up downtown. I just went in there the other day. It's gorgeous. Um, we have Dimitri's that has decided to put their main bakery in the downtown area. We have Arts After Hours that's thriving. The Lynn Auditorium, those of you that can remember two hours ago, Councilor Cahill said he was late getting here because there was too much traffic downtown. I had the same problem. I did have tickets to the Alice Cooper show tonight. I, I decided not to go there because um, I wanted to be here with you. My, I did drop my daughter off down there, however, so I saw the traffic. Uh, I have 101 reasons to re-elect Mayor Judy Kennedy. It's coming out in three parts for the pamphlet. Part one is here. You're welcome to take one on your way out the door. I think that the city is moving forward. Um, again, if you look at 2009, 2013, see the progress. I would like to continue that progress as your mayor uh, for the next four years. And I would please ask that you vote for me, Judy Flanagan Kennedy, on November 5th. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, you know, there are good things happening in the city of Lynn. You know, the Lynn Auditorium, it's a great thing. But the Lynn Auditorium is in its eighth year. The Lynn Auditorium first show was in 2006. I was on the city council in 2006. Her Honor was not the mayor. Her Honor was not on the city council at the time that that happened. The first show was the Boston Pops. It's gone on for eight years. So I don't know if it's actually fair to take credit for the city auditorium. I think it's great that Dimitri's Bakery is in Lynn with a tax incremental financing agreement from the city council. Rosetti's with a special permit from the council. Tax, uh, excuse me, Kettle Cuisine with, a, uh, with a, a tax incremental financing agreement from the city council. But what I find frustrating with those things that are coming in, I see Johnny's Food Master building vacant. I see the Blockbuster Video building vacant. I see Lynn Lumber gone. I see White's Laundry undeveloped. I see Anthony's Hawthorne falling apart. I see no development on the South Harbor. I see no development on the Beacon Chevrolet site. Uh, it seems like every time we take a step forward, we're taking three steps backwards. And we have to really address that. We have to do have creative thinking and do something different, or we're just going to be status quo right now. And that's what I think that we are. We're just status quo. There are a lot of good things happening, and it's not I, 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 I. It's people doing things together. And that has to improve in the city of Lynn, and that has not been good over the past four years. But that being said, I want to you know, talk about, end on a good note. And one of the things that I'm very proud of, something that I, you know, about with the African, African American community, that I think is very substantive. It's something that I worked on with, and I pulled out an old picture, and Damon Harrison was in it, Daryl Murkison was in it, and Tim Potter was in it. And it was 1993, and in 1993, in front of the, city, the Lynn School Committee, um, I brought the proposal to change the name of Easton Junior High School to the Thurgood Marshall Middle School. It passed unanimously. Easton Junior High School is named after a part of the city. Thurgood Marshall had just passed away. Supreme Court Justice, famous for, for Brown versus Board of Education, what he stood for. What I thought when I did that, and what I think now, is that was more than just symbolic, because every kid that ever goes through that school now is going to find out or should know who Thurgood Marshall is. But I didn't do it because he was a great African American. I did it because he was a great American. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to bring Daryl up to the floor to close up, but before we do, Miguel Funes, he was late. We're going to give you 90 seconds to make an appeal to us, and you have a hard act to follow, brother. <laughs> it is. But they always save the best for last. <laughs> My name is Miguel Funes, and I'm running for office. Council at Large for the City of Lynn. I'm not here to make you promises. I'm not here to make you anything that I can accomplish. I'm here to be, to be the voice 
of the people to unite this city, to make it that the way that we are sitting here tonight, and if you look to your left, and you look to your right, you're gonna see a minority sitting right next to you. That's how the city is built. This is a brotherhood neighborhood, a place that we all love and enjoy being here. I moved to Lynn in 1992. My kids went to Lynn English, and my daughter went to classical. Good schools, good program, good education, except for one thing. When it comes Thanksgiving Day and that football, <laughs> I, I don't know who to learn more. <laughs> but I hope that I can have one of the four boards come November 5th. You know, one of the things that I'm really more concerned about is the way that the city crime is happening. We're not going to read on the papers except minority names, which has been going on. Okay. I have a plan to reduce the guns in the city of Lynn. It happened in Brooklyn, New York. It happened in California. He happened in Lawrence. Uh, is to reduce the arms that we have on the streets. And by doing that, we can reduce the violence and save tax taxes that way as well. I do thank you. And uh, Darrell, thank you. I hope you all have a good night. And remember, we got four this. I'm number four in the project. So if you go one, two, three, four, I'm in. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out this evening for one, um, to make one quick announcement. Ms. Pearl Brown just mentioned to me that the Community Minority Culture Center is going to be having their annual Martin Luther King, King Day. Is it breakfast this year? It is going to be a luncheon, a luncheon and where is it going to be held? Davisport Yacht Club. Do we have a date yet? January 20th. Where can tickets be attained? Okay, so it's forthcoming. All right. Thank you for that, Mr. Brown. Appreciate it. But again, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out this evening. Mayor Kennedy, thank you for your participation. Council President Fraser, thank you. And all the other candidates. And what we hope that all the constituents here in the city of Lynn left here more informed than when they came. So again, remember to vote November 5th. And we can make a good informed decision. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you very much. Drive carefully.